Good day, everybody, and welcome to Lesson 7 of the Ben and Boz Narrated PowerPoint Series. I'm Boz. I'm Ben. How you doing today, man? I'm feeling good. Feeling good? I'm feeling great, you might say. How are you? I'm about to record one of these videos. Nothing better than this, man. You're on a high. I'm on a high. All right. Well, Lesson 7, yeah. Fixed and Intangible Assets. I'm excited about it. I think you're taking this one. I am taking this one, and it's it's time. I'm just going to sit back and relax. Thank chime you. in with you can unnecessary chime in comments. Every now and again. Well, I'll keep us on task. We'll be out of here in three minutes. I'm just kidding, three everybody. Minutes. We will right. not. Anyway, let's get into it. So, fixed assets, usually pretty large here. So, Boz, you can you guess what company this is? You know, I probably wouldn't have been able to guess it. How about except... what type of company? That might be a better question for you. <laughs> what type of company? It's got mm -hmm. a massive amount of inventories, so I would have gone with uh, a retailer as an okay. example. But we're looking at property, plant, and equipment. So what does that tell you? <laughs> um, that they have a lot of kind of stores, probably. I'm guessing it's a retailer, so it's someone it with a it lot is. of yep. with a lot of big stores. You know, I'm, you always just think when you think retailer, you usually go to Walmart first. So that I might have guessed them just because these numbers are huge, but it's not. No, because we use Walmart pretty much <laughs> every time, so right. we change it up. But before you figure out what company it is, I just want to highlight some of the different types. When we say fixed assets, mm -hmm. there are a lot of different types that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. So land, we're not really going to talk about that here. You don't depreciate it. You just buy it. That's a big one for the hip for this company, the land. They own mm -hmm. their own land, too. Although a lot of retailers now, they're starting to lease their land. Oh, that's true. Where they sell it to receive cash right away, and then they just lease it right back to themselves. So oh. shareholders get the immediate cash. Wow. They get the flexibility. Wow. Yeah. Great. Beyond the scope of this video. You get your bonus <laughs> right away. Bonus. Um, buildings and improvements, that's mm -hmm. pretty major. Equipment, fixtures, construction and process, we're going to talk about that a little bit. It's where they're building their own assets. CIP. And then all that's added together for gross property and equipment. Subtract depreciation, which we're going to learn. That's pretty significant mm -hmm. um, to end up with our net. And so, gross does not mean disgusting. It just means before we, any adjustments are made. We've had so made. many things that have said gross so far, and I did not make that joke, but, you know. All right. All right. Sure Thanks for bringing go. us there. That just means no adjustments. All right, everyone. It's not Costco. Oops, it's not Walmart. It is Costco. It is Costco. It's, Costco. So. it's not Walmart. It's Costco. Yeah, I love Competitor Costco. to Sam's Club. Yeah, I'm a big fan as well. Mm -hmm. Um Although if you're listening and you're from Walmart, nothing against Walmart. All right. <laughs> All right. So overview, what we're going to do here, three main points with the sub point that we're looking at. Number one, we want you to understand the accounting for property, plant, and equipment. We're going to go through inception. So purchasing or creating an asset. We're going to handle what do you do when you have maintenance? What do you do to depreciate it? Basically the ongoing stuff all the way through the end with disposal. Inception means creation. Thank you, boss. Yeah, just making sure. He's, you're doing a great job. All right. Um, and the biggest piece with this is the three main methods of depreciation. That's probably the heart of this lesson, heart I would and say. Heart soul. Um, we're going to briefly touch on how to deplete natural resources. It's similar to depreciation, but just a little bit special. So we'll do a quick slide on that. And then we're going to end with a little bit of a broad accounting of intangible assets, what those are, what that means, and mm -hmm. how you work with them in accounting. Sounds good. Some people listening right now might say, I don't even know what do you mean by an intangible asset. Got to stay tuned. Stay tuned after this commercial break. That's all right. Thanks for staying tuned. Staying tuned with us. <laughs> it was. Bad. It was. Okay. We can cut that out, right? <laughs> no, we're leaving that. Yeah. All right. You know, that's fine. That's all right. You got to be vulnerable sometimes. Editing that makes you look silly. That's leaving fine. That hey, whatever makes you look good. <laughs> all right with that. Um, all right. So let's start with the acquisition, property, plant, and equipment. Again, it's commonly referred to the plant and equipment as your fixed assets. So some examples of property, plant, and equipment, land, office buildings, factories, machinery, vehicles, computers. What else do you got to add, Boss? Those are normally just you know what I think of. It's you know what does a company need in order to produce stuff is mm -hmm. what I usually think about. They need a, a plot of land, a building, and then machinery and computers and stuff like that inside. And some that's going to last for more than a year. Yep. Usually. Yep, exactly. All right. And then how do companies acquire it? We're going to look at two different ways. The By far the most common one is buying from another company. But mm -hmm. as we saw with Costco, they can also construct their own assets. That would be Costco building their own stores, probably building some warehouses, things like that. Exactly. All right. So um, one thing we want to set out for its own is the difference between capitalizing and expended, expensing and what that actually means. Mm -hmm. So when we capitalize something that's when we actually create an asset. We're saying, okay, we're gonna use this 
whatever it is, this factory building is an example, we're going to use it for more than one year. So we're going to go ahead and capitalize it, put it on our books as an asset, and then we're going to record the expense a little bit every single year as we use up that cost. Sometimes think as capital assets more as long-term investments. That helps. Yeah. So, and then the alternative to that, outside of capitalizing, we could expense it. And when we expense it, we immediately, it goes right to the income statement. It's going to reduce our net income, which companies might not be super excited about. We'll talk about that in a bit. Now that's a good teaser. Yeah. Stay tuned, everyone. That's right. Uh, all right. So, say we're going to capitalize something. We find an asset that we purchase. We know that we're going to use it for the next few years. And we decide, all right, we need to capitalize it. Well, what can we actually include in that capitalization. So a couple of examples, just trying to think of a question to stump you a little bit as we went, but nothing popped <laughs> off the top of my head. So um, it's, it's not, not easy to stump me. I was just saying it's not hard to stump me. So. <laughs> it's not just the purchase price that we're looking at here. You can also include sales tax, legal fees, transportation costs set up. Um, the bigger picture here, anything to get the asset ready for its intended use. So Simple thing, like if I purchase a computer for $1,000, but there's 7% tax on that, 70 bucks, I pay Amazon 20 bucks to ship it to me, then I have to record the 1,000 plus the 70 plus the 20, all of those would be included as my asset. I wouldn't uh, you know, expense the shipping cost of $70. I wouldn't expense the, uh, or the shipping cost of 20 bucks and the tax of $70. They would be lumped in with the asset. Yeah, and that is pretty common. I ran into this a lot with companies purchasing equipment in particular, where if they're purchasing equipment, but then they're heavily modifying it for their own manufacturing process, they have a lot of additional costs to get it ready for use that they end up capitalizing and expensing over time. Um, so that's if an asset is purchased, but what if the asset is constructed? So if we're gonna build our own asset, now we just capitalize anything that we had to spend in order to do it. Usually materials are gonna be a small piece, labor is gonna be the biggest piece. And just an interesting little tidbit here, if you take out a loan to finance the construction of your building, any interest that you have on that loan while you're building the building, you can capitalize that. Yeah, we're gonna get into journal entries in a bit, but what that means is that if you pay $100 of interest on a loan to, uh, to, to build a building, as an example, you wouldn't debit interest expense for $100, you'd debit the, the building asset for $100. Yeah, and on the other hand, if you purchase something and you take out a loan to buy that same building, um, but you're purchasing it already constructed, you do not get to capitalize the interest cost. Whoa. Do you know why that is? Do I know why that is? I'm not, do you know why I it did is? It. I'm yeah. just trying to stump you. I, I'm I just guess trying to I can think about it a little bit. So, but I think it's probably because you're purchasing the asset when it's already completed in that second situation versus the first one. It's really building it throughout the process. I, don't know. I would think the seller would probably already include their interest yep, costs yep. in that price that they yep, yep, sell to you. Sense. So it's already thought it was, was being paid for. I was kind of thinking that. Yeah. You articulated yeah, it. Yeah, but better. I said it. You did. So you did much better. Ben <laughs> is better. So. I actually do have a recording of Boss saying that from this summer. When I'm having a rough day, I just play that on a loop. That's right. Uh, anyway, all right, so what are journal entries with this process? So first we're going to look at when an asset is purchased. And when we purchase it, we are going to debit whatever fixed asset account it is. And then our credit is generally going to be to cash or to notes payable. So what does that look like? Debit to factory, assuming we paid a million dollars for a factory. And then we credit notes payable for a million bucks. Done. I have nothing to add to that. Thank you. Pretty straightforward. <laughs> it was. It's nice when you know exactly what the dollar amount is. If you paid cash instead, you'd credit cash there. Yes, thank you. That is correct. High value. You could even get a little tricky with maybe it's like a mortgage payable. Whoa. Of a note payable. Whoa. More specific with yeah. the note. Yep, yep. Usually you usually don't see companies doing that, though. Not as much. I agree with the notes payable. I yeah. like it. All right. So, what if the asset is constructed, Ben? <laughs> Thanks for keying that one. Do you want me to let you no, talk a little? No, no, this okay. is like yours. All right. So, when an asset is construction is constructed, it gets a little bit more complicated. So, throughout the construction, any time that usually it's probably going to be around financial reporting dates, we're going to record any progress by debiting an account called construction in progress and crediting cash or notes mm -hmm. payable. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, the first one it was four hundred k happened again for 600K. Now I'm saying it's done, right? We've debited construction and process, credited cash or notes payable, but it's no longer in progress. We're ready to move in and start setting up. So when construction is completed, we debit factory and credit construction and process. So you can see this construction and progress account 
we set it up with a debit balance and then when we're done with it, we credit all of it and just move it to one of our traditional fixed asset categories. I think we could call that a temporary account. You could. Yeah. Nominal. Nominal. <laughs> all, right. Um, all right. So um, those entries kind of cover the setup. The initial, we're ready to go, we have our asset on our books, but now we're going to use it throughout the year, throughout the years, hopefully longer term, and we're going to talk about depreciation. So one key with depreciation that I hear students struggle with almost every year is that we are allocating the cost of the asset over the useful life. We are not measuring the value of the asset. This is something completely different. Some assets, maybe if it's land, that's going to go up in value. Other assets, maybe if it's like a truck or a car, that's going to go down in value. We're not trying to measure that value. We're just allocating the cost. We're saying, here's what we paid for it, and we want to allocate the total amount that we paid for it over every single year that we're going to use it. Yeah, it's a limitation of accounting that it, accounting does not show fair value with, uh, with many assets. But a lot of that would just be too subjective, and uh, that would just uh, really create uh, you know, too much judgment, I think, is what would happen. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so in order to actually record our depreciation, we need to know three different pieces. One, what is the cost? We talked about that, all the different things that you can include in the cost. Two, how long do we think we are going to use it? What is the useful life to us? Maybe we buy a car, we say we're gonna use it for five years. Yeah, and mm -hmm. actually used to audit a trucking company and they would say about five years uh -huh. on their trucks. Nice. They call them tractors and trailers. I know. So they're tractor trailer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. Getting outside just this. First time I ever heard the phrase tractor trailer, I was working in Pittsburgh actually, and they talked about tractor trailers creating jam ups on the freeway. And I thought that like Farmer Johnson had his uh, <laughs> tractor out there, but no, but this no, was a semi. Last. No, it was a so semi. I felt some, you know, silly that day. So right. They told me about that. Well, then you learn and you still remember. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, all right. So not only do we need to know the useful life, we also have to estimate the salvage value. Value. and what salvage value is that's where say we're done using that truck can we resell it for something are we gonna run it into the ground can we scrap it for parts what can we do at the end of the useful life for us how about you I've seen most companies it seems like they estimate zero for the salvage value mm -hmm. basically they're gonna scrap it for nothing or no material amount at the end of the use basically don't anticipate they're gonna have any value left in it mm -hmm. and so notice number two and three those are both estimates companies don't know that they're gonna take their best guess and usually they're going to set up a policy. So all trucks will be five years. Sorry, all tractor trailers will be five years. <laughs> all buildings will be 30 That's years. Right. They'll, right. they'll set up um, mm -hmm. predetermined amounts. And then, okay, so we know those three pieces of information. Then we know there are three different ways to measure depreciation. One, straight line. Vast majority of companies do this. Same amount of depreciation every single year. Number two, units of production. They try and match it to however much their asset is going to be used. So that truck, for example, if you drive more miles in one year, more depreciation that year. If you drive fewer miles, then it's less depreciation. And then declining balance where it allows companies to take extra depreciation right away, the thought being that the value of the asset is going to decrease over time. Which one would you say they use the most? Straight line, 95% of the time. Take it to the bank, 95%. Let's start with that as an example, and I think the most important. That is a great idea. Why don't you talk us through this first part? Great segue. You want me yeah. to do straight line? I think I can handle this one. So Yeah, you do straight line. I'll do units of production. You can do declining because that leads into tax. Whoa. Eventually. I like to, I like to talk about tax. So, uh, Well, straight line depreciation. So Ben just commented that we have to know cost, estimated life, and salvage value. So let's say that we got Costco purchasing a forklift. Cost of 100 grand, they're going to use it for five years, and then contrary to what we said, they're going to have salvage value at the end. It of makes 10, a better 000. example. It does way. make a better example, so of $10,000. So then we have to compute depreciation expense per year, and the 100,000 minus the 10,000, that numerator simplifies down to 90,000. 90,000 is the amount that we're going to depreciate over five years. So that'll result in 18 grand of depreciation expense per year. So we can use this formula every single time? Every single time, time we that we do straight line depreciation, yeah. yeah. 
Cost minus yep. salvage value. What mm-hmm. are you going to mm-hmm. expense over the life of it divided by the life? Whenever you say like every single time, it makes me wonder if there's an exception. I know. It, it, me nervous, it always I don't makes know. me nervous when it's every time. Every time, man. Every yeah. time. I no, that wasn't my intent. <laughs> That's no. right. okay. it, it is every time. I think pretty much every time, yeah. Oh, yeah. So now the journal entry for year one and the financial statement. That's impact. what I really care about. You care about journal entries. No, so financial statement. Financial impact. statement yeah. impact. Mm-hmm. So... The debit goes to depreciation expense, and the credit goes to accumulated depreciation. We would have learned this one, I think, back in Lesson 4 is when we introduced Yeah, but this could concept. you remind me? Could I remind you? Just for so, the sake of the video. Well, what... No, the, actually for my own sake. For your own sake. So, <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But depreciation expense, we, we, we debit that. That is just the expense uh, associated with kind of the using up of fixed assets. And then the credit goes to accumulated depreciation and not in this situation forklift or equipment. And that is because when we get done using this asset, we're still going to have that forklift. So, you know, you think of supplies. When you use those up, you actually credit the supplies account because when your post it notes are gone, they're gone. When you have fully depreciated your forklift, for example, it's still going to be sitting there. It's probably going to be in you know pretty rough shape, but it's still sitting there. So that's why they use accumulated depreciation, which I would refer to as a contra asset. That was a great. I haven't thought of that supplies analogy before. That's a good one. Oh, thank you. I like it. Old dog's got a couple new tricks once in a while, you know. Always learning <laughs> from you. Right. Always learning from you. And then, um, yeah, and then year one, go back. I didn't say go forward yet. So <laughs> then year one, we've got depreciation expense. And I just wanted to show on the bottom right-hand corner that balance sheet, the forklift of 100000 Then we've got the accumulated depreciation. And then we'll show the net balance of the forklift at the 82000 And most companies will actually just show net property yep. plant and equipment mm-hmm. i had to search a little bit to find costco yeah um that would break out the actual specific Oftentimes, types of assets and yeah. then the foot yeah usually on the balance sheet it's probably net right and mm-hmm. then the footnotes they will show gross and then like the accumulated depreciation and then get down yeah. to that we're feeling a little chippy tonight i kind of like it a little edgy so. on less than eight pretty much less than yeah. seven less than seven less than seven that's right all right what happens in years two through five Pretty much the same thing from a uh, from a journal entry standpoint. We just we continue to have depreciation expense uh, and accumulated depreciation. We'll do that all five years, and then uh, really the only change is on the balance sheet. You notice that the forklift balance of a hundred thousand doesn't change, but the accumulated depreciation just keeps getting eighteen grand higher per year. So at the end of year two, the accumulated depreciation will be thirty six grand. The end of the year three, fifty four grand. Year four, seventy two grand. And at the end of year five, it will be ninety thousand dollars there in the bottom right hand corner. You know, of your I screen. couldn't keep up with your mental math, but <laughs> yes, you probably that is be correct. Able to count by eighteens in and my head. We'll see how it add up by twenty and subtract two. But you were just going boom, eighteen, wow. eighteen, eighteen. That's yeah. how you do it. Huh? Yeah. So eighteen, some... you add twenty. That's thirty-eight. Right, and then it you is. subtract two from that. Well, I could to do add that. it for eighteen. Yeah, yeah. get Ben some flashcards after the after the session here today. So, yeah, income statement always eighteen grand on the balance sheet. As accumulated depreciation increases, that'll decrease the uh, the net value of the asset on the balance sheet. Cool. That was exciting. Thanks for All letting right. me do straight line depreciation, You're welcome. man. I want to take it back though for units of take production. Take it back. You take this one. All right. Thank you. So we have the same situation here. Costco purchased a forklift for 100 grand. Salvage value is 10 grand. The big change in this one is that the estimated life, instead of saying five years, we put it by 15,000 machine hours or 15,000 engine hours. I don't know if you knew that, but that's actually how they measure the productive capacity of a forklift. How long are they going to be running the engine? Mm -hmm. And so. What we're doing under units of production is we're trying to match our depreciation expense each year into how much we actually use that forklift. So if we were to look at this, our formula changes a little bit, where we have cost minus salvage value, that's good, over useful life in units is the key. Before it was useful life in years, now we're in units. So if we apply that to our situation here, $100,000 minus $10,000 tells me I need to depreciate $90,000 total. And I'm going to depreciate it over my best guess is 15,000 hours. So that comes out to every hour that I use this machine, I should record a journal entry for six dollars. <laughs> I don't know if you would do it every hour, but you would not. At you the end of every period, you just count. You just basically, you'd, uh, in reality, is you'd, you'd probably call up someone in the in the plant, right? Basically, mm-hmm. and how many how many hours does that forklift run? Mm-hmm. And if uh, they actually have counters you? in these, did you know that? 
I suppose counters. I suppose the good ones would feed right back to like corporate and the accounting yeah. folks, wouldn't they? So. Yeah, if you wanted to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That would be nice. Anyway, so what is our journal entry in year one? Assuming we use the forklift for four thousand hours, so straight line. We didn't need to know how long we used it or anything like that. It was just year one, right? We're ready to go every single year. With units of production, we need to know each year how many hours was it used. So the actual accounts going to be the exact same. Just the way we calculate the amount is going to change a little bit. So 4,000 hours at $6 of depreciation per hour. So 4,000 times 6, Boz. That's twenty four thousand. And it's because the math. answer was in front of you, wasn't it? I it was. I could have done that. I wouldn't have needed to like add twenty minus two like you would have done or whatever. I, I don't know how that would even work on this one. But, <laughs> wouldn't have, but. So debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated depreciation for the twenty four thousand. Mm-hmm. Um, that and debit then, and credit doesn't change. Yeah, it's just the no, amount that changes. The amount changes, and as you can see, depreciation expense still hits our income statement, so we're mm-hmm. reducing our income by twenty four. And then on the balance sheet, same accounts, forklift, and accumulated depreciation for that forklift. So we have a net value of 76. Mm-hmm. So In theory, I look at this one. This probably is more accurate than straight line, mm-hmm. right? And yet you said 95% of companies use straight line. Mm-hmm. Any thought why that is? I'm just... Yeah, so I think what the companies would say is that when we do this, we have to get one more input every mm-hmm. single year versus mm-hmm. when they do straight line, they just set it up in a lot of their... Yeah, um, fixed yeah. asset systems, yeah. and it runs automatically. Simplicity, materiality. And so, yeah, yeah, as an auditor, I would come at it and say, hey, you know, before you said it was 18000 under this method it would be twenty four, so we're off by six grand. Mm-hmm. You know, And this is Costco with $20 billion of mm-hmm. net fixed assets. And they come back so, and say that's immaterial. Yeah, we're sometimes it might be it. six grand high, sometimes six grand low. You know, mm-hmm. so while it's more, yeah, more refined and accurate, perhaps, it's just, it just would take more time. Just wait till the summary slide. Ooh, let's, I can't wait. Yes. All right. Good so we're here. Um, what happens year by year then in the summary? Um, you can see each year here, we are recording the hours that we use the machine. Depreciation rate does not stay the same. We set it at six right away, so it does not change. <laughs> It, you say it does not stay the same. I'm just thinking ahead. I wonder yeah. where you're going with that. It one. does not change. It does not change. Spoke. Yeah, it stays it's, the same okay. at six each time. Mm-hmm. So our depreciation expense is always going to be the hours that we use it that year times the rate of six gives us our expense, and then accumulated depreciation just adds up each year. It just works out perfectly this way, doesn't it? You know what? What? What if things don't work out exactly as we planned? So I'm gonna say that if we estimate when we buy a forklift that it's gonna run for 15,000 hours. I'm just gonna speculate that it's not gonna run for exactly 15,000 hours. Probably so not. We probably might be not. off by an hour or two with that estimate. <laughs> At, least At least one or two. So what happens in that case is we're just gonna take our last year and adjust it to meet whatever our expected salvage value was. So mm-hmm. let's change the scenario. You see up here, they're each going down by 500 hours used. Um, but now I change it so um, this year four we had three thousand, and then the last year it's twenty five hundred. Mm-hmm. As you can see, if we would take full depreciation twenty five hundred hours at six dollars per hour, that comes out to fifteen grand of depreciation expense in the last year, which would put our accumulated depreciation all the way up to ninety six thousand. Mm-hmm. So that was higher than we thought it was going to be. That was only going to be ninety. And so if we still think the salvage value is ten thousand, ten thousand, so a hundred thousand minus the ten thousand salvage value would mean accumulated depreciation should be 90, we would cheat almost this last year so that our ending accumulated depreciation comes out to be 90. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point. If we actually used it more, maybe our salvage value would truly be lower, and then we would just kind of leave it as is and not make that adjustment. But if we still think we got that same salvage value, we'll uh, make the adjustment you just noted. Probably just another reason companies use straight line, too. They I don't have so. to think about that or analyze it every good year. Point. All right, declining balance. So I'll introduce this one. But I know you want to talk about it. De- declining balance because it's closer to tax. It's closer to tax. Yeah, that's true. So we let's let's go with the same facts here. So Costco purchasing the forklift for a hundred grand, five year estimated life, ten thousand salvage value. But they're going to use a double declining balance method, which we have to do in this situation. Our formula is we have our depreciation rate, and we do that equals then one over the useful life multiplied by two, because we're using double declining balance. Had we been using, some companies use 150% declining balance, and then we would have multiplied it by 1.5. So what we're doing there. That first is, part of the equation, that's really similar to straight line, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, depreci- yeah one, 
it, that it would be the same straight line, basically, <laughs> exactly. just another way to look at it. So as opposed to depreciating a fifth each year, we're going to multiply that by two and depreci- depreciate 40% each year. Uh, he can do fractions value. and percents, everyone, can, not just I integers. Can. So we use the phrase, we're going to depreciate 40% of the carrying value each year. Sometimes we'll refer to that as net book value. But carrying value or net book value, that is the cost of the asset less the accumulated depreciation. So we go to year one then, and uh, we'll do the journal entry and the financial statement impact. And the carrying value at the start is $100,000. We don't reduce that by the, uh, by the salvage value yet. We'll eventually mm-hmm. get that into play but here. for now, but, we just ignore it right away. Yep, because carrying value costs less accumulated depreciation. You know, cost is 100 grand. Accumulated depreciation is zero at the start of year one. Multiply it by 40%, we have 40 grand of depreciation in year one. That's our expense and that's our accumulated depreciation. And then similarly, in the balance sheet, we have 40 grand of accumulated depreciation and 60 grand of net book value, which is now also going to be considered our carrying value. We tried to keep you up so that we say it at the same time. Well, I did. It. You didn't. Well, I tried to catch it. it. And now we get our 60 grand, which would be our carrying, carrying value. Oh, God. Oh, I rushed it. I rushed it. <laughs> <laughs> in any way, got to keep find ways to keep ourselves amused here. So then we go to hopefully uh, keep you a, guys amused uh, too. Hopefully, so go to the you know go to our next summary schedule here in year two. Our carrying value is sixty grand. Forty percent depreciation is twenty four thousand. Accumulated depreciation is sixty four grand. Year three, our carrying value is thirty six grand. That's the hundred thousand of cost minus the sixty four thousand of accumulated depreciation. We multiply that by 40% to get our depreciation, and our new accumulated depreciation is 78400 This is it, why you want me to do to it. Me, it's just a... It looks to me like depreciation expense is declining. <laughs> it's shocking. Year it? over it's, year, isn't it? It, it? it is. It's the declining balance method. Huh. Declining. Uh-huh. So crazy, yeah? Good more way depre- to remember it. More depreciation up front. So year four, 21600 multiplied by 40% is... 8640 of depreciation expense, $87,040 of accumulated depreciation, which leaves us a carrying value of 12960 Now, if we multiply that by 40%, we get the depreciation expense, and we get accumulated depreciation of 92000 and some change. The issue with that, and go once more here, is that now we have more than 90 grand of depreciation. And, and remember, we said our salvage value is 10000 so we can't have depreci- accumulated depreciation of more than 90000 So in that final year, or in whatever year here that you go above, um, your accumulated depreciation would get too high, meaning that you, you would be kind of over your salvage value. You just make an adjustment to cap it off. In this situation, cap it off at ninety grand, so that we still have our ten grand of salvage value. Yeah. You wanted me to do that slide. That's a you know actually a lot of I was numbers I was not one. even going to read all those. I'm going to go through <laughs> one and two, and then you see the pattern. We can move on. But it's true. So, um, but summary slide. You know, we've just got it. Right. Oh, you want to do the this summary? One. This yeah. is the summary. Yeah. Sorry. So, Whoa. It's all good. Whoa. It's all good. We'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's cool about this is that you can see side by side. We have the exact same total depreciation over the five years. Doesn't matter if we use straight line, units of production or declining balance. It is the exact same total um, amount over time. So straight line evens out. I think companies also appreciate that they can anticipate what that expense is gonna be if they're trying to predict earnings per share. They have a little bit of insight into depreciation expense. Um, Units of production, there is, you're not really sure exactly what it's gonna be. And then declining balance, you take a big hit right away, which might not be so good for earnings per share. Um, but in those later years, you don't take as much of a hit. So Exactly. So now, what do you choose, right? And then... This is Boz's you know, slide. I can't. Slide. Yeah. But, you know, a goal of financial accounting, we think about this when we want to give useful information uh, to people. You know, so we, we want to be useful, but at the same time, companies keep in mind materiality, simplicity, and the fact that they like to show high net income such that I think they usually choose straight line because of uh, all, all of those factors that we just listed. Now, for tax purposes, they've got their own different set of rules. And 
for tangible assets other than buildings and land, um, and maybe like landscaping or something, but companies generally can deduct 100% of the cost of the asset in the year purchased. And they, is that new tax law stuff? Well, it's kind of been, the simple answer is yes, that's now in place with the new tax law. There's been some rules historically that have allowed you to do that from time to time. So it kind of changes every year. But so companies, it's interesting, a company could show financial statement income, but not pay any tax. That tends to tick off the public. So <laughs> they see profitable companies that don't pay tax, but it's because they can take uh, full depreciation expense for tax purposes in year one. And they like to do that because then they, uh, then they don't pay any cash taxes. So when we were talking about inventory, we said a company has to choose LIFO or FIFO, and they do both for tax and book. But here for depreciation, you can have a different method for tax than you do for book. Yep, exactly. That's what they do. You know, cool. Straight line for book and then special method for tax purposes. Yeah. I'm glad you put that in there. Oh, thank you. I'm happy to <laughs> add in the comments. All right. So during use, by far the biggest piece is depreciation that's happening every year. But there are also going to be periodic repairs, maintenance, um, and also potentially some additions or improvements. Maybe you expand your plant and so you can store more, right? You add, in a, add a warehouse onto your factory or something like that. So um, for repairs and maintenance, we're talking about any sort of routine cost to make sure our assets are still in proper condition. I get an oil change in my car, right? That would be maintenance, I would say. Um, key with these, they do not extend the useful life of the asset or increase its value. You kind of just got to do it to keep it going. Um, additions are improvements, on the other hand. These are referred to as capital expenditures, to get in some technical terms here. And so with capital expenditures, we're talking any sort of significant expenditure that's going to increase the life or value of the asset. Um, maybe if, like I said before, I add on to my factory building, or maybe in my truck that I was using for Costco, the I put in a brand new engine so I can keep using that truck for the that's next what I was 10 years say, or for something. Example. What the else are you going to say? Well, that's what I was going to say, that one. So now I, you're Ooh, gonna, getting <laughs> snippy. I, getting snippy, that's right. So, but, I like it. It's more fun that way, a little mm -hmm. edgy. Mm -hmm. So you want me to move on? Sure. I'm about to key you up here. Okay. All right. All right. So um, when we use big examples like that, an oil change versus a brand new engine in a truck, mm -hmm. it's pretty straightforward. It's not that hard. But it is not always clear, and a lot of times you do have to use the judgment. And the reason for that is the company itself, they have an incentive to capitalize their expenditures. So if I'm looking at something, I can take a big hit right away, a big expense on my income statement, or I can put it on my balance sheet and spread that out over time. That seems kind of appealing, doesn't it? It does. Uh, it's, it can be a problem, though, because you're just def deferring the expenses. So, but this, has, has it ever been a big problem before? Uh, it, it has, um, and I guess just, we'll go right to it. So in 2001, 2002, WorldCom spent $3.8 billion that it should have expensed. It, it was for items that were more having a current benefit for the company, but instead they capitalized them and they actually inflated their income by $3.8 billion. Then after this unraveled, WorldCom declared bankruptcy. The auditors, Arthur Anderson, ended up going out of business for their role kind of in that, and also the Enron scandal as well. Um, but th you know, this one for public companies, this is a really sensitive issue. Public companies are under a lot of pressure to produce earnings. And this is an area that um, if you have unethical, you know, uh, chief executives that, that they can uh, they can decide to, to try to push things here a little bit and record assets when they should record expenses. There you go. Heard mm. it from the ethics expert, Boz Bostrom. I appreciate the shout out, man. <laughs> I mean it though. <laughs> All right. So what do these journal entries look like? Um, if we have, say, maintenance expense, we're going to debit maintenance expense, probably credit cash for something small like that, maybe accounts payable, but usually cash. Um, if it's an addition or an improvement, we're going to debit a factory or whatever a fixed asset is and credit the cash. Um, so that kind of takes us through. We started with what do we actually capitalize for an asset, then we went into during the use. Now we're going to go at the end to disposition, so we are getting rid of all of our fixed assets. We say disposition. It could be a sale. Oftentimes, it's just scrap it as mm -hmm. well, so give it to the junkyard. Yeah, breaks mm -hmm. down. Sometimes it just costs you money. You don't mm -hmm. get any payment for it. But mm -hmm. in our example here, a company is going to sell a building that had a cost of 100000 accumulated depreciation of seventy, and they receive $25,000 in cash. 
So we want to figure out what is the gain or loss on this transaction and what is the journal entry. And to compute that gain or loss, you got to look at the proceeds, which in this case are 25000 Subtract off the net book value, which is 100000 of cost, less accumulated depreciation is seventy. And in this situation, we would have a loss of $5,000. Probably should have put some brackets around yeah. that one. So. Uh. I was getting all excited to cheer for a game, but we ended up with a loss. So. $5,000 <laughs> of a loss. So. But you can see it right here. Yeah. Our proceeds are twenty five. We had it on our books for thirty, so obviously the proceeds are less than what we had it for. Mm -hmm. So we got to take a loss for five k on that. Yep. So then getting into the journal entry, well, what do we know? We know we got cash for 25000 so debit our cash for 25000 We know we had accumulated depreciation of seventy. Well, that normally has a credit balance, so we need to remove it. Right? We got to get rid of that. So if it had credit, we need to debit accumulated depreciation to get rid of it. We have a loss. Losses are like expenses, so we're going to debit the loss for 5000 And then finally, we have to get rid of this building that had a debit balance of 100 We need to credit it to get rid of the building, take it off our books, cancel it out, if you will, in your mind. So credit the building for 100000 yeah. So that's an example where we had a loss, and then the next slide is just an example where we have a gain. So same exact thing, except there is uh, cash that the company received here of 45000 Woohoo! Woo Getting rich! Instead, that's right. Instead of the previous slide, 25000 So. It, you know, proceeds forty five grand, net book value is still thirty. So now we have a gain of fifteen thousand. The journal entry is structured largely the same with one exception. We still debit our cash, but this time it's for forty five grand. We still debit our accumulated depreciation uh, for the seventy grand. Um, but this time instead we're gonna credit instead of debiting a loss of five grand, we're gonna credit the gain of fifteen. Woohoo! Woo <laughs> and credit the building of a hundred thousand dollars. I like this one better. We do. We do like this one better. Yeah, Usually exactly. companies do have a loss, though, on retirement. And mm -hmm. That's okay. Yep. Or they're fully depreciated. That's true. And there's really no entry. That's true. Um, all right. So one quick example here with depletion. This isn't super common, but oftentimes or sometimes companies use natural resources. So they record depletion. That's the term that we use when referring to natural resources. Depreciation is fixed assets. Depletion is natural resources. So we would record that using units of production. So say a company purchased a tract of timber for $900,000 with an estimated 2 million board feet. And yes, I did look that up. That's how you measure it. Um, the land will be worth 50 k after the timber is harvested. So what is the journal entry here? Well, first thing we look at, what is our cost per board foot? This is our rate, similar to units of production. The cost of the asset was 900 k minus our residual value of 50 k meaning we have $850,000 that we're going to deplete divided by the life of 2 million board feet. So 850,000 divided by 2 million gives us 42 and a half cents per board foot. So the journal entry then in year one, we have an expense of 100,000 board feet that we harvested at 42 and a half cents each for 42,500 total. Um, and that leads to depletion expense is debited and accumulated depletion is credited. I have nothing to add. Yeah. It's not that common and it's fairly straightforward. So if you know units of production, you'll be pretty good. Let's move on to intangibles. You have a lot to add there. You do a lot of work with intangibles. I do. do look at yeah. intangible assets a lot. So when I think of intangibles, I'm just thinking of assets that aren't physical. They have no tangible substance. Two main groups, the indefinite live intangibles, and they're generally they're going to be created when one company acquires another. That's when you normally are going to see these. In theory, you could acquire um, a trademark from another company, but uh, it's usually when you have a an acquisition of one company uh, to another. And then the the examples of the of, of the indefinite live intangibles. Goodwill is the prime example, but trademarks or brands, a trade name. Uh, that's just uh, Coca Cola. Uh, that, um, that's uh, that's the Coca Cola trademark. That would be an example. It's the Coca Cola name is not going anywhere. It doesn't get used up over time. Um, and so Coca Cola doesn't have any value on that trademark within their own company because they developed it themselves. Mm -hmm. But if say Pepsi were to buy Coca Cola, it's yeah. not going to happen. But say they were going to, yeah, yeah. then they would assign some value of that purchase to the Coca Cola trademark, and that would be an intangible asset. 
Yep, exactly. So, and then you do not amortize these. So you basically just have to check for impairment each year. And what that means is uh, just what is the value of these intangible assets? What profits and cash flows do you expect to get from them? And uh, if it's greater than the value of the intangibles on your books, you don't do anything. But if, uh, the, um, if the value you compute of the intangibles is uh, less than their carrying value, then you have some sort of impairment charge. Yeah, and so when we say amortize here, Amortize means the same thing as depreciation, except for you just, it's a special term for intangible assets. Mm -hmm. So you depreciate a fixed asset, you amortize an intangible asset. Um, so definite lives and tangibles, these are things that do expire. So some examples, patents, copyrights, franchises, licenses, things like that, where you can't touch a patent, right? A patent, the right to produce something using a certain method, you can't touch that, that's intangible. There's a piece of paper that says you have that right, but the actual right, you can't touch it. And so what we're going to do is record amortization on these items to allocate that value over the useful life. So um, amortize, there's no separate methods or anything like that. You just use straight line. No uh, units of production. No, declining use, balance. no declining balance, no anything. So as a simple example here, a company developed a patent, it has a 20-year life, and they capitalize it at a cost of $50,000. So what is the amortization entry? Well, we know $50,000 per year, or 50,000 total over 20 years gives us 2,500 in amortization expense per year. Could you have done that, mental math? I could have, yes. Good. I like mental math. Good. Good. Could you have? Uh, yeah, I would have doubled the 100, <laughs> divided by 20 to get five, and then cut the five and a half to get 2,500. Are you serious? Think how many more mental math Gosh. computations I do in my head Gosh. than you do. Yeah, you do a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> debit amortization expense, credit the patent, and there you go. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, these are huge issues for companies that do mergers and acquisitions. So, that you don't see those a lot, mergers and acquisitions, but when you do, it introduces a huge amount of intangible assets. Because I think... If you develop a patent internally, it's kind of the cost of uh, you know what you put into that. But all of a sudden, you have a, an acquisition standpoint, and that patent is is quite possibly going to be worth a lot more. So it marking a, everything up yep. to fair value is yep, part yep. of the so it acquisition. becomes a becomes a huge issue. Yeah. All right, we've done a lot, haven't we? We have. So um, it was a fun session. It was fun. I enjoyed yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Some of the key takeaways here. So, um, what do we capitalize? Any cost to bring the asset to its intended use. Um, after it is with, this, with its intended use, we want you to depreciate or know how to depreciate using three methods, straight line, units of production, or declining balance. Um, after that, we got a little bit into natural resources, so we're going to deplete them, and that's just very similar to units of production. Our indefinite live intangibles, well, we talked about what they are, and now we test them for impairment annually, and then our definite live intangibles are amortized each year. Mm -hmm. So. A lot of different things, but um, hopefully you enjoyed it, got some out of this video. Thank you guys for tuning in again. Appreciate it. Yeah, I won't. You know, wasn't the most sexy stuff that they're ever gonna learn. Financial ratios is pretty sexy. So, but uh, <laughs> this wasn't the most uh, sexy stuff that they're ever gonna learn. But uh, it's 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 huge. It's, it's important. getting pretty risque. <laughs> pretty risque. So. <laughs> Well, thanks everyone for tuning in and come back next time on Lesson 8 when we're going to start getting into liabilities. Liability. Oh. <laughs> See you, man. Bye, everyone.